Hello, I'm Scott Zash. I am the author of the book, The Captured, the story of abduction by Indians on the Texas frontier. And I'm speaking at the Mason Square Museum in my hometown of Mason, Texas. And today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about my research, what got me interested in this topic, and uh, explain a little bit about my family connection and just what I learned, not only from my own ancestors, but from other kids who went through this same experience. So I'm gonna be talking about kids who were captured by Southern Plains Indians in either the 1860s or early 1870s. So our time frame here is the Civil War and Reconstruction and all the disruptions that those events caused. During this time, there were two areas of Texas that were still hit fairly hard by Indian raiders. Uh, one was the northwestern edge of the Texas Hill Country, which is where I grew up. The other was an area north and west of Fort Worth. And both of these areas really were the frontier because there wasn't a lot in terms of permanent settlements once you went beyond them. And so those areas were attractive to Indian raiders because they were sparsely settled and it was easy for them to get in and out quickly without getting caught and chased. Now, the, uh, the tribes we're talking about are mostly the Comanches, the Kiowas, and the Lipan Apaches. And all three of these groups went on raids periodically, which uh, essentially served two purposes. The main purpose was to get more horses. The Comanches in particular relied heavily on horses, uh, not, not just for transport, but also as a form of wealth and prestige. And the other purpose for young men of going on raids was to prove themselves, prove their bravery and gain status. Every now and then during one of these raids, uh, the raiders would take a human captive along with the horses. And the purpose of this, uh, again, was twofold. One was commercial. These captives, who were usually children and wouldn't try to escape, uh, they were seen as the property of their captor. And so uh, they could either be kept as household servants or they could be traded to someone else or to another tribe in exchange for horses or blankets or other goods. But during this time period I'm talking about, the 1860s, early 1870s, the other reason for taking captives, and I think this was the more important reason, was to build up tribal numbers. Uh, the Comanches in particular had lost a lot of their own people, uh, both to warfare and diseases. And so they were hoping that if they could um, take these children when they were young enough, and we're talking ages usually seven to 14, that they could adopt them into their tribe, place them with a family. These kids would, would get to like the lifestyle that uh, they were experiencing and would want to stay with them and help them fight against the encroaching settlers. And that is what happened in many cases. Uh, when these kids were first taken in a raid and first arrived in an Indian village, they were usually tested to see how well they could ride or shoot or fight. But uh, eventually they became um, adopted members of the family they were staying with. Uh, they forgot their native tongue, uh, they learned the language of their captors, and they, they became quite comfortable in this, this life they were living with the Southern Plains tribes. 
Now, in order to understand how these kids could have adapted so readily, uh, we have to know a little bit about what life was like for children on the Texas frontier. Uh, they really didn't have um, a childhood the way we think of childhood today. Uh, many of them could not go to school because they lived in areas that were so remote that there was no school nearby. And in most cases, their parents were working so hard on the farm that they really didn't have a lot of time to teach their kids and spend time with them. And so uh, these kids didn't have a lot of other children to play with because people lived too far apart. So what these kids did from an early age was work. Uh, one of my great-great-grandmothers at age 10 was sent to be a maidservant for another family. Uh, my ancestor who was captured by Indians, Adolf Korn, was out herding sheep for a neighbor by the time he was 10 years old. In fact, he was herding sheep at the time he was taken by three Apaches who were out on a raid. And so a lot, one of the things these children responded to when they reached an Indian village and were with an Indian family was that they really didn't have to work much. Um, the girl captives were sometimes required to help bring water or firewood to the camp, but the boys really were not expected to do that much other than learn to ride and hunt and shoot. And so compared to the lives they had known back on the farm, this, this seemed pretty, pretty ideal to them once they got used to it. And so the, uh, the Southern Plains tribes would start taking these captured boys with them on raids when they were as young as, oh, 11 or 12. And uh, some of these captive children, including my ancestor, um, participated very willingly in these raids on white settlements. And... Uh, would uh, sometimes take the lead in stealing horses. So they became uh, very much Indianized during the time they were with the tribe. Um, most of these children were eventually sent back to their parents. Now, how did this happen if they were happy and didn't want to go? Um, a lot of times the federal Indian agent um, who was located at Fort Sill, now Oklahoma, uh, would be the one who would arrange for these children to be sent back to their parents. Keep in mind that their parents in the 1860s and 70s really were at a loss as to how to find their kids because, um, of course, the Indians had taken them very far away. Uh, most of these parents did not have the money to go out and search for themselves, to go from trading posts to Indian agency to ask questions and see if anyone had seen their children. So really all they could do was write letters to either the military or the Indian agents and uh, tell these government officials what had happened, give a description of their children, and just hope against hope that maybe somebody would come across their child one day. And in fact, that is what happened. Um, in a lot of cases, the, um, the captive children were traded for Indian prisoners that had been taken by uh, the U.S. Army. Uh, in other cases, the federal government actually did pay a ransom of up to $100, but uh, the bigwigs in Washington tried to discourage that practice because they thought it was encouraging Indian raiders to take more kids so they could get a $100 reward. And so by the early 1870s, uh, the authorities in Washington had pretty much ordered the Indian agents to stop paying ransom and instead try to find another way 
to coerce the Indians into bringing their captives to the agency. Um, my ancestor, Adolf Korn, was brought to the Indian agency at Fort Sill after he had been with the Comanches for almost three years. He was originally taken by Apaches, but a few days later, they traded him to a group of Comanches they came across. And by this time, he was uh, very much enjoying the Indian way of life. He was on his way to becoming a Comanche warrior. And he was not at all happy about being sent back to his parents. By this time, his parents had left the Texas frontier and moved back to downtown San Antonio. So in the fall of 1872, my ancestor and his fellow captive, Clinton Smith, were brought back to San Antonio and created quite a bit of excitement there because all the local journalists and the public wanted to uh, come down to downtown and see these two wild white Indians that they heard were coming back. And uh, according to Clinton Smith, during all this chaos, when all these sightseers swarmed them, all of their Indian gear was stolen. And so there was none of that to be passed down in our family. Um, my ancestor, by the time he got home, was about 13. Uh, he was a teenager anyway, and he was a Comanche teenager who was not happy to be back in white society. And so, as you can imagine, a lot of these captives, when they first came back, they, they were hellions. They caused quite a bit of trouble, just stealing, you know, stealing chickens, stealing hogs, um, shooting at anything that pleased them. And my ancestor reportedly caused so much trouble in San Antonio that uh, the local law asked the family if they would please take him out of town. And so when he was about 16, they went back to the frontier of Mason County and bought a place here. Uh, most of these kids, even if they had only spent a year or two with these tribes, um, still had an affinity for the Indian way of life for the rest of their lives. And they always, they always lived kind of uncomfortably between two worlds, um, and they were never fully at home in either. You know, they, they felt the disassociation uh, from their adoptive people, the Southern Plains Indians, but they could also never fully reassimilate with their, their own people. And um, this caused a lot of problems um, for both the girl and boy captives when they were adults. They, uh, not surprisingly, uh, had marital problems. Um, a lot of them couldn't really hold a job because they liked the freedom of the Indian way of life. They liked to move around a lot. They couldn't really, really settle in one place and build something. And so many of them, them had troubled adult lives. Um, some of them, by the end of their lives, when they were in their 60s and 70s, um, did become minor celebrities in Texas. They um, would appear at the old trail drivers reunions in San Antonio. Uh, two or three of them wrote captivity narratives, which were popular reading in the 1920s. And so they did finally, toward their in, the end of their lives, gain some recognition. But it was, it was hard for them during most of their adult lives to really readjust. A lot of these captives had very troubled adult lives. They, they really didn't fit in either world and they were, they were kind of caught between the Indian and white way of life. 
a lot of the boy captives uh, periodically throughout their lives would go wander off into the woods for several days. They would never tell anyone where they were going or what they had been doing. Um, they still liked to eat raw meat. They liked to sleep outdoors. A lot of them had marital problems, not surprisingly. Uh, they liked to, to move around a lot. They really couldn't settle down in one place and, and hold a job because they liked both the freedom and the mobility of the Indian way of life. And so throughout their lives, they, they really did have trouble reassimilating back into their own people. I'm gonna talk a little bit right now about the second most famous Indian captive from Texas. The most famous, of course, was Cynthia Ann Parker, who became the mother of Quanah Parker, the last Comanche chief. The second most famous uh, was a young man from Mason County, Texas, named Herman Lehman. And he became famous in the 1920s because he wrote a memoir called Nine Years with the Indians. And as the title of his book suggests, he was with the Southern Plains tribes longer than most of his fellow captives. Herman was almost 11 years old when he was taken by Apache raiders in Loyal Valley, Texas, which is located between Fredericksburg and Mason, Texas. He and his younger brother and two younger sisters were out in the fields scaring birds away from the crops when this raiding party of Lipan Apaches showed up on the farm and managed to grab Herman and his brother. The other two children were not hurt. A few days later, his younger brother was able to escape and get back home. But Herman, despite being pursued by um, a patrol from Fort McCavitt, uh, was, was not... Um, was not recaptured. And so he went on and spent about six years with the Lipan Apaches. He became highly assimilated. He rose to the position of a minor chief in his group. When he was um, a teenager, about 16 years old, he got in a fight with an Apache medicine man and kill this man. Now, in the Apache tribe, the tribe as a whole did not punish a murderer, but the victim's family was free to take revenge if they wanted to. And so Herman had to flee from his Apache group to avoid retribution. He spent a fair amount of time on his own on the high plains of Texas until he happened across this group of what I call renegade Comanches because this was after the last Comanches had surrendered in 1875 and gone to their reservation on Fort Sill. And there was this group, a small group, that either had escaped from the reservation and run away, or perhaps they never even went into the reservation. And so by 1877, they were out fighting the buffalo hunters on the high plains of Texas. Herman became part of this group, which means he participated in some of the last battles between Indians and whites in Texas. In the summer of 1877, the military at Fort Sill sent Quanta Parker out to try to get these renegades to come in. And Quanta found them um, near the current site of Roswell, New Mexico. He spent about four days in their camp negotiating and trying to convince them that 
they needed to come in, their way of life was over. If they didn't come to the reservation, they were bound to be killed eventually. And finally, they reluctantly agreed to go with him back to Fort Sill. They were just a few miles from Fort Sill and Herman Lehman, who was um, close to 18 years old at this time, he decided he just couldn't do it. He couldn't give up the free life. And so he bolted and ran off. Quana chased him a little ways, finally got him to stop. Herman said, I'm not going to the reservation. Quana said, okay, at least come stay with me and my family and you can look after the horses. And so Herman Lehman did live with Quana's family for several months. It wasn't a very happy time for him because, you know, he missed the old days and the freedom and traveling from one place to another. Finally, um, Herman's mother back in Texas got word that there was a white boy living on the reservation at Fort Sill. And she had never given up hope of finding her son. Her neighbors all told her rather cruelly, oh, forget about him. He's probably dead by now. But she, she didn't think that was right. She always believed he had lived. So she wrote, wrote to Colonel Ronald McKenzie at Fort Sill and said, you know, is it possible that this is my son. She described him the way he was at age 11 when he had been taken. And um, Mackenzie asked that Herman Lehman be brought in. He wasn't sure if it was this woman's son or not, but he thought, you know, she's waited so long, I'm going to send him back to Texas and uh, uh, let her decide for herself if, if this is her boy or not. Herman had to be sent from Fort Sill to the Texas Hill Country under a guard of three or four soldiers from Fort Sill because they knew that if he wasn't accompanied and coerced, he would never go back on his own. So they brought him back to Loyal Valley, Texas, where his mother was running a hotel at the time. Uh, they weren't sure at first, but his mother and sisters finally agreed, yes, this was Herman. Herman himself was very unhappy to be back. Um, the neighbors had all prepared a huge feast for his return and he was terribly offended because he saw a ham on the table and the Apaches thought that was unclean. And so he kicked over the table. He caused all sorts of trouble. He refused to come in. He refused to sleep inside. And so his younger brother, Willie, the one who had briefly been a captive with him, would sleep out in the yard with him and try to keep him company. Eventually, Herman got used to being back with his own people, although, you know, he had spent so many years uh, out with the Southern Plains tribes that he could not completely give up his ways. For instance, um, he, would, he would go out and shoot a deer, tie it to his horse, and then bring it back home and expect his sisters to do all the work. And so it was a hard period of adjustment, not only for Herman, but also for his family, who couldn't really understand, you know, why he wasn't glad to be rescued, to be back with them. Uh, as Herman grew into adulthood, he had a very troubled life. He got into a lot of fights. Um, he, for a brief time, 
ran a saloon in Loyal Valley, Texas, but he said, I drank all the beer and, and got fat and there went the profits. So he never was really successful in most of the ventures he tried. Um, he tried writing his first book about his experiences in the year 1900, uh, had his copies printed, which he was going around trying to sell. He tried to cross a flooded creek in a buggy and lost most of his books uh, down the creek. And so that book, which had the cover title of Indianology, is a very rare book in Texas today because so few copies remained. Uh, the last time I found a copy online, I think it was selling for $1,500. So if you have a copy of Indianology, hold on to it. Um, Herman later went back to uh, Oklahoma after the reservation had been broken up. And in the early 1900s, he tried for years to get an allotment of land as an adopted Comanche so that um, he could be back with his, with his friends from the old days. Finally, I believe it was 1908, Congress, uh, through a special act, granted Herman an allotment near Granfield, Oklahoma. And he did live there with his family until about the 1920s. And in the mid-20s, for whatever reason, he got a desire to come back and see his family in Texas. Uh, when he got back, he became a minor celebrity in the Hill Country. Uh, this was about the time that he wrote his book, Nine Years with the Indians. And he became an attraction at county fairs and rodeos. He would dress up in his regalia, and his trademark act was um, they would release a calf into the arena. He would chase it. He would shoot and kill the calf with a bow and arrow. He would jump off his horse, cut out the calf's liver, and eat it raw in front of the audience. And uh, he did this many times, so there are, are many stories about Herman Lehman eating the raw liver. He spent the rest of his life with his brother Willie and Willie's family in Loyal Valley where they had grown up and uh, he died there in 1932 and there is now a Texas State historical marker at his grave. Uh, and that is Herman's story, which uh, still fascinates people today. My ancestor Adolph Korn was 13 years old when he was brought back to his family. And then at age 16, he ended up in Mason County on a ranch um, where he did a lot of work such as digging wells and building rock fences, which of course he, he didn't like because that was the exact opposite of the life of freedom that he had known uh, with the Comanches. At some point, and we know very little about this part of his story, um, he did go back to Oklahoma and married an Indian woman and they had a son together. Um, we know this because of his fellow captive, Clinton Smith, with whom he kept in touch. Apparently, that marriage did not work out because he ended up back in Mason County in the 1890s. And he worked for a while breaking horses, and then he became a recluse. He went off by himself and lived for a time in a cave in a bluff on a creek in Mason County. And uh, his older sister, who was my great-great-grandmother, was concerned about him. Um, periodically, she would send a basket of food out to the ranch where he was staying. And the rancher would send his 10-year-old son on horseback with this basket of food. 
The sun would lower it on a rope down the bluff to where the caves were. Adolf would take the basket. He would acknowledge with a wave to the boy that he had received it, but they never had any conversation. So he lived a very lonely life. Um, he died at age, I believe, 40. One, we don't know what the cause was. Um, he spent his last couple of years in the home of my great-great-grandmother, his older sister, and she took care of him. Um, because he died so long ago, the year was 1900, we really uh, didn't have a lot of family stories about him. When I was growing up, the stories I heard were all very consistent, inconsistent, and um, were minimalist because there was so little information known about him. Uh, he was buried in a cemetery uh, just east of Mason, and I believe the year was 1999. I was out visiting that cemetery when I accidentally came across his grave, which was um, barely marked. And I remembered the name from my grandparents' stories, had no idea he was even buried in Mason. And when I saw his grave, that's what motivated me to try to learn a little bit more than what our family knew of Adolf Korn and you know, try to at least get enough information so we could get him a decent headstone, such as when he was born, when he died, and most importantly, when he was with the Indians and who he was with, because nobody knew. And so in the course of researching his story, um, as I gradually came across bits and pieces, I also learned more about his fellow captives that he knew when he was with the Comanches and Apaches. And so I expanded the story I was telling to include the experiences of eight other children. And so we finally got my uncle Adolf Korn a decent headstone. And um, in death, he has also become a minor celebrity because I occasionally visit this cemetery and find that passersby have stopped at his grave and left tributes. I've found, of course, many stones, many coins, um, a dream catcher, a plastic horse. You just never know what you will find at Adolf Korn's grave. Uh, the result of my research was this book called The Captured. It tells a story of nine children, white children, who lived with either the Comanches or the Apaches in the 1860s and 70s. And I try as best I can to tell their stories all as, as one. And uh, the book is available pretty much any place where you normally buy books.